a picture. It shows the name and affiliation, I guess. Oh, it does. All right, we've gone live now. Um, it's nice to see everybody uh, joining this session. I'm super excited about um, the group that we have here. I'm going to talk about uh, some innovative devices, especially in emergency medicine. Uh, we have a couple great speakers in that. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, Gordon Saul, who is uh, one of our uh, great faculty members working with biodesign here. You can give just a quick intro of yourself, Gordon, and maybe everybody else can kind of have their discussion before or introduce themselves before we go live. <clears throat> Yeah, so Gordon Saul, I'm the executive director here at Stanford, a program called BioDesign. Uh, this is where we te teach a needs-driven uh, innovation framework for doctors and engineers. So very happy to be here. Maybe others want to introduce themselves? I'm Joseph Parvisi. I'm uh, a neurologist at Stanford uh, Healthcare, and I'm also a uh, founder of uh, Cerebell, which is a portable um, handheld pocket-sized brain monitor device used in emergency care. Marjan? Hi, I'm, um, my name on here is Zara, but I'm Marjan Askar, and I am a faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine. I'm a pediatric ER doctor um, with um, some expertise in point-of-care ultrasound, and um, I have been um, using a number of handheld devices uh, to um, teach and guide um, virtual ultrasound, and that's why I'm here to sort of talk about that experience and reflect on that. Great, and Jeff? Uh, Jeff Hirsch, I've been an uh, emergency room doctor for decades. Uh, presently, I'm also the chief medical officer mm -hmm of the Massachusetts uh, Disaster Medical Assist Team. Um, but the main uh, job I have is as Chief Medical Officer for General Electric Healthcare, where honestly, as a company, we are actively working on improving lives in the moments that matter, which very much includes optimizing point of care ultrasound uh, to augment all aspects of emergency medical care, um, as well as medical care in general. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. And I know we were, uh... Uh, uh, James Malt from BioIntelligence, I think, is supposed to join us, so he may be joining us shortly, but if he does, we'll give him a chance to introduce himself. Um, so uh, the topic area for today is innovative devices in precision emergency medicine. Uh, precision medicine is a popular uh, top uh, subject at Stanford these days, um, subject to lots of interpretation. So for the purposes of this talk, um, this we're, we'll focus on technologies to, to better manage acute care and we'll talk and sort of wherever the setting. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, the center I uh, run, help run at Biodesign uh, focuses a lot on unmet medical needs as a starting point for innovation. So any of my questions will be from that lens. So maybe, Joseph, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so uh, first, first question, was this the first company that you that, you, that you've started? Yes, that's right. First company. That's very exciting. Um, so maybe what was the uh, what was the unmet need that you saw for Cerebell? Maybe like what was the world before Cerebell, and what do you see as right. the world after Cerebell? Right. So as I mentioned, I'm a neurologist, so I saw the need from from the other side of the fence, where emergency departments uh, has spent, let's say, doctors in the ED have spent hours uh, basically waiting for neurology consultation to finish and then neurology consulting services they have mris and cts and blood tests but you know if there's no structural lesion if there's no gross abnormality and yet the patient is semi-comatose or altered the gold standard is to get uh, a brain wave analysis very quickly or the eeg which is literally um, the ekg of cardiology is EEG for neurology. So uh, EEG took about four hours. We did a study at Stanford. It took four hours to get to the first uh, minute of EEG data. And then God knows when the neurologist is going to uh, be able to contact the EEG experts uh, to review the diagnosis and uh, give the data back. Um, in the last decade, uh, there, have, there has been a surge of... Um, uh, publications showing that uh, if somebody is having really abnorm abnormal brain waves, 
uh, which is status epilepticus, uh, the, 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 the worst form of it. If they leave the patient in that state, the patient is going to have longer hospitalization, brain damage. And if, uh, God forbid, you don't detect it uh, for days, a patient may actually leave the hospital with major uh, IQ drop. So the unmet need was, why does it take so long to get to a brain monitor? It's almost like exactly ultrasound story. You know, the uh, EEG, you have to wait for a big rig to be hauled to the ED by an by a specialized EEG technologist. And then you have to stream the data to a, to, to, to a neurologist to review it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, literally very, uh, parallel to um, those days when radiology was, uh, it, what was, was tasked to review the ultrasound. So I came up with the idea that we should have something that uh, uh, could be applied by ED physicians and ICU physicians and neurology consult team and uh, the product, uh, fast forward 10 years, uh, we now have a product that's uh, in about 300 plus hospitals, including our own hospital. Uh, basically, it's a handheld pocket size um, monitor and has a sensors over the head. It takes two minutes to apply it. Nurses, respiratory therapists, e ED techs, neurology residents, everybody can do it. And then it actually shows the da uh, data on the device itself, but also it sends it to the cloud. When it sends to the cloud, two things happen. One is the conventional way of reading the brain waves, which neurologists love to review visually. That's available. So they can review it from their iPhone, iPad, or a computer. But then the good part, the second part is the AI part. So once the data is in the cloud, it uh, does computations and feeds back to the device at the bedside uh, in case abnormal activity has been detected. And thereby, ED physician who has not been able to contact the neurologist or a neurologist is not available, the ED physician knows something is wrong. I will just finish, I will just finish with one little story of patients uh, on Easter weekend and that basically tells you what this device is uh, capable of doing. It was a two-year-old um, uh, lethargic uh, kid who had stopped eating for several days and was semi-sleepy, comes to the ED. They do all sorts of blood tests, etc. They think it is some sort of a malnutrition. And they were planning to uh, uh, send the patient back for follow-up with a, a general practitioner. AD physician says, well, uh, let's do this uh, cerebral device to see if we can find anything in the brain. And then they basically put it in there and AI starts screaming, saying uh, abnormal uh, status has been detected. And then basically they start thinking about the brain. They uh, push the uh, kid a CAT scan and the CAT scan shows a large tumor that has bled. The patient is about to herniate. And that's how they med flighted the patient from this small, tiny hospital to UCLA. So this is the power of AI. You don't actually need a technologist or a neurologist to right. basically be present. Okay, thank you. And by the way, to the organizers, I got a couple co comments about the background music. Can we, if we could turn off that music, that would be awesome. Um, so thank you. And Marjan, do, do you, have you had some experience in the clinical environment? Are, are you aware of the Cerebell device? Have you, have you uh, made use of it? I haven't. Um, and I was just, my ears were perking. That's awesome. I just had a kid um, yesterday that uh, just last night on shift that if I had this, I probably would have used it. Um, the kid had come in with uh, a couple of unusual, this was a, a two and a half year old, a couple of unusual episodes of just uh, screaming um, because of a headache, of a temporal headache. And at one point, the kid screamed so much that they had a breath holding spell and was like blue. Um, mom had this on um, video and I discussed the options with her. And I said that, you know, um, right now the neurologic exam is totally normal. Um, and so this shared decision making, I said, I can obviously do a quick CT, um, but it, it, there is radiation. The rapid MRI that we have is not suited to pick up, you know, um, tumors of, of caliber that I'm interested in. 
um, and we could miss something falsely. And the other option would be for you to be referred to neurology and get a legitimate MRI under sedation. And um, now I'm scared to death because, uh, you know, the mom opted to do the latter and did not want any radiation. But if I had this device and um, anybody would have screamed at me, obviously the the uh, course of my actions would have been very different. Very I find good. this just um, fascinating. I don't, um, if you're at Stanford, I just am not aware of this in our ED, in my work environment. Uh, it's uh, it's in the adult side. Uh, the pediatric side uh, is, uh, is okay. a work in progress. Oh, it is a work in progress? That's right. In That's order to awesome. Be- but you know, in order to get the AI into ED, you have to have all the stakeholders to agree, and it's not an easy task. Oh, to, please! Uh, I'm completely aware of what's easy and what's not, but I'm just fascinated by this device. That sounds yeah, all ears you. are up. That's amazing. Very interesting. Okay. Well, Jeff, I'm going to get to you in just a minute, so please don't uh, feel left out here. Um, so just just a little bit follow up on on that. So we often. Um, I guess two two quick questions, and if we could, you know, around this. So um, it, we we have a number of translational grant programs, and uh, a tech, uh, I would say a technically a technology different use case, but same environment came across, and there there are always sort of two two questions in a critical care environment, for example. You know, there's a lot of noise going on, a lot of alarms. There's a lot of you know, how does how do you rise above that? I guess, and the second question is around diagnostics and, you know, general are much more, have better opportunities if there's a clear therapy, uh, therapeutic choice associated with it. So maybe you could just help me with both of those questions. Uh, Do you want me to? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Um, I think when it comes to the accuracy of AI, you're absolutely right. We decided to really um, focus on what really matters uh, for patients' um, prognosis instead of making the AI so accurate that it detects all subtle abnormalities because we thought that's going to create too many false alarms and it's going to have an alarm fatigue. So we focused on what's the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is that there's an abnormal activity for five minutes continuously. And that's that's where the brain starts getting damaged. And we focused on that one. And the sensitivity and specificity is great. There is not a big problem of um, false positivity. And we were very cognizant of that. And you're absolutely right. Um, One of the problems, um, uh, one of the problems, Gordon, uh, without blaming anybody, is that when you let only engineers design a medical device, they try to make it like perfect to uh, be kind of um, fancy and uh, perform uh, and detect all sorts of subtle abnormalities, et cetera, perhaps. But in clinical practice, that's kind of a nuance and it may not be really uh, uh, the matter of life and death for patients. So focus on something that you have high confidence you're going to detect with good specificity and good sensitivity. So I guess just to say that, so your advice doesn't like cry wolf, uh, it, when, it, right. when it indicates something, it's even then it's then it's useless, time. right? Then yeah. it becomes useless. Yeah. Um, but then uh, also, uh, we don't we don't want the AI to replace the neurologists uh, uh, fully. Uh, so uh, we want the AI basically be interpreted in light of the clinical decision making and clinical uh, clinical judgment and suspicion, which makes the accuracy of the AI even even better. And so, in terms of therapeutic, yes, absolutely. I think for the brain, you know, if you detect, for example, status epilepticus, if you uh, treat it with medications that are very cheap within within 20 minutes, you are you may be able to stop it completely. But if you let this go, then of course the ther- therapy will become very difficult um, and so on. So yes, it's not just diagnosis, but it is coupled with therapeutic. Yeah. Okay, so, and you so you you made a choice that so this is a c- clinical decision making tool as opposed to a definitive diagnostic. Is that right? Uh, that's right. So it's okay. almost like a risk management and clin- uh, diagnostic okay. a- actionable uh, information is given to the pay, uh, to the doctor. And that was probably a little bit easier from a regulatory perspective. That's right. Uh, we got approval uh, faster. Yeah. Well, good. Can that's- I ask a question? Um, 
I want to be mindful of time, so please, if I'm allowed, I just ask one quick question. Yes. Um, so I know that in pediatrics in particular, even with fever, uh, and I don't know much about the adult world, but with the fever, there are known um, literature that shows what goes on in the brain and that it changes. In fact, this is the whole premise for what happens with, in a febrile seizure. So um, say if a patient is um, febrile, and you're doing this, does the AI have ways of sort of, uh, I don't know, dilute those normal for fever type of um, activities? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. So uh, to stratify the AI decision making based on some, some sort of background clinical information. Yes, uh -huh. it is possible. Yeah, it is something that we are working on because we wanted to first go with the status epilepticus then the nexus, delirium, stroke, you can do all sorts of stuff with AI. Uh, and there you need to have some ancillary information inputted because that enhances the accuracy of the AI. That's yeah. right. Well, and uh, so let me um, just uh, transition a little bit. So we talked about some acute care uh, approach in, inside the hospital. So um, let's maybe move out of the hospital to the home um, so, you know, Rod, if I may, before we move out of the hospital, and this well, we're going to come back, Jeff. We're going to come yeah. back to the hospital, but I wanted okay. to cover something. So, work okay. with me. All right. So, um, so in preparing for the session, I, I looked uh, um, around this evolution to the hospital to the home, and some people would talk about the healthcare returning to its roots in the 19th and early 20th century, where you know you had house calls and things. Um, and I guess I remember I had a personal experience when I was in Japan and I became ill and a doctor came right to my hotel room and gave me uh, medicine, uh, antibiotics right there. Um, and that, that was an expensive luxury. Um, I wonder, um, you know, we're now seeing this hospital home becoming more prevalent. Um, is this a buzzword, a, sort of a COVID driven fad? And I wondered, uh, Jeff, to maybe get your perspective on what maybe a GE, GE Healthcare thinks about this new world um, of home healthcare. So we could health. break up home healthcare into two different conceptual. One, is there a clinician providing home healthcare? And then the second one would be, is the patient somehow being more dynamically involved in their own home healthcare? Um, a kind of little bread and butter and maybe a little boring um, because it's so well known. But uh, I'd, I'd like to just focus for a second on uh, point of care ultrasound, yep. where point of care ultrasound is obviously a very useful clinical diagnostic tool at the bedside, as well as a diagnostic tool to actually give um, a more definitive diagnosis. Um, and of course, uh, point of care ultrasound in the hands of a clinician, we all know can assess many different organ systems, many different pathophysiologies, and many other conditions. It can also be utilized in the hands of the patient themselves. So when I look at a high level of where we're driving point of care ultrasound, there's four conceptual directions that um, we need to go where AI will play a very big role in all four of those. The first one I would talk about is image acquisition. We all know that it does take a little bit of a skill set to do that. There's no reason the AI can't dynamically help the clinician with that. I'll give just one example. Um, you could use um, one of our devices and it will literally draw a green line when you have a good high quality image that you should be utilized. Um, and it'll draw a red line around it if the image quality is not um, good enough and the image itself is not good enough. For example, it does that with uh, um, calculating uh, real-time ejection fraction. The, the one to speak to the home, though, um, uh, how the device can interact with, um, first of all, it can interact with the clinician. Probably everybody on this call has used uh, ultrasound in order to help them do uh, some kind of procedure, whether it's just starting a line, uh, doing a tap, or whatever the other procedure is. But to go to the home, uh, which was particularly the question, We've actually just uh, partnered with a company called Pulse and More, where you would have a woman who has, for example, a high risk pregnancy who needs very frequent assessments. And she will have a small little ultrasound device that her, her cell phone 
will hook into this device and she will be able to do a uh, pregnancy ultrasound on herself, real time interacting with her obstetrician or her healthcare clinician to assess are there any issues with the pregnancy? So she could get extremely frequent um, uh, health assessments in her high-risk pregnancy and uh, acquire the images herself. So some of this, the AI obviously helps a clinician acquire images better, but this is a device that will act dynamically, interact dynamically with the patient themselves. Um, the other ways that I think you've already spoken about and Joseph has already spoken about um, it would be nice if the AI could help interpret the data that it gets. Right. Obviously, that exists. Uh, we have a bunch of examples of that already on the market, one which will actually quantitate how many B-lines you see. So you can do serial exams on uh, somebody's uh, um, uh, issues that they're having within their lung. For example, are they um, responding to therapy for congestive heart failure? Um Many other examples of that, uh, quantitative EF, uh, quantitative um, IVC index. And then finally, reporting um, for the clinicians who are, um, you know, in the audience. We all know if you didn't write it down, you didn't do it. doesn't matter if you did it. If you didn't write it down, you didn't do it. So ways to be able to document this in a more straightforward pattern. Um, so all of these things are coming into all of the... Um, AI that we're utilizing for many different devices. And although point of care ultrasound compared to a, a new uh, EEG doesn't kind of sound as, uh, you know, we're all used to it a little bit, the um, path forward and the improvements that have been made and the utilization of AI in point of care ultrasound is truly game changing and is truly changing the practice of clinical medicine dynamically, both in the clinical setting, specifically in the emergency department, but also at home, also with the primary care's office. So, um, yep. uh, and I would say that the coolest part of this, just because it's kind of fun and uh, you know not a not as much bread and butter, the um, uh, pocket ultrasound. Um, there's a bunch on the market. Um, obviously, um, I have a, a bias um, having uh, seen the image quality that that we have, but it's literally a device which is smaller than the palm of your hand and it will use your phone as a screen. All the software will be on the screen. It's completely wireless. It's called vScan Air. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, in its way, incredibly revolutionary in what it will be able to do to support clinical care. I think so. So maybe if you could, because, I, you know, obviously G is a big company and, um, you know, sort of, you know, can be, um, you know, a trend center in terms of, uh, so as, what is the GE sort of perspective around moving acute care from the hospital into the home? Um, and alongside of your ultrasound products, are there other technologies or, that you see that are going to enable that uh, or need to be developed to enable that? Yeah, it's a great question. And it already exists to a large extent. You know, we take for granted so much the ECGs that we do in the ambulance and the AI, which is already helping interpret those ECGs in the ambulance. Um, we're doing more and more of this. I could focus um, on ultrasound again, where we will all, everybody on this call, we will live in an age where we will have our uh, paramedics in the field utilizing point of care ultrasound. This will also uh, transition to other acute care settings. It already exists and is already being utilized in many countries. So both within the clinical setting as well as um, in the home as the, the OBGYN um, uh, device that I already described, but being able to utilize um, these as well. There are definitely other imaging modalities, um, portable ultrasound, um, uh, not the only one. Uh, you can do x-rays. There are smaller and more portable um, uh, x-rays and other imaging devices, as well as um, uh, other other tools that can be used. One of the real important ones is um, uh, remote uh, tools to collaborate with clinicians. So what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to take somebody who maybe doesn't have the highest level skill set and be able to real time guide them, for example, to be able to obtain quality images and interpret those quality images. So Yosef, you were talking about exactly that, how the neurologist could look at the images 
and how the neurologist would be able to be supplemented by that AI. This already exists as well in uh, point of care ultrasound where you can do a real time exam and have a highly skilled uh, clinician literally guide your hand and say, oh yeah, go a little bit there, go there. Oh, that's the perfect image, hold it there. What do we have? So th this is called, uh, um, and this is a product that already exists. It's called My Remote Share. Um, it exists on our uh, little um, handheld ultrasound. So although some of this is futuristic and some of the stuff, uh, Joseph, you talked about is futuristic, obviously some of it's already here. Well, these are some of the examples that are already here. Yeah, because I've always seen that a barrier to wider spread use of ultrasound as an imaging tool was the you know, dependence on the operator and the skill of the operator. So it sounds like that's... Um, uh, so um, it sounds like... And uh, Marjan, it sounds like you, you've worked a lot, a lot about this as well, a lot of the handheld applications for ultrasound. Maybe talk about your vision for this. And I'm, I'm trying to get this balance of technologies that are, you know, in the acute care, in the, in the hospital setting, but also how this can uh, potentially move towards and enable things to be done at home. Um, so um, I'm sorry, um, I apologize. It's hard to hear, but uh, did you say you're trying to sort of transition it to see not only in the acute care setting, but at home? Yeah, I'm trying to get, sorry about this, the audio. And by the way, for folks that are submitting questions, we're going to get to question Q&A at the latter. And so if you do have questions, please put them in the comments and we'll, we'll get to those. So um, I'll speak up. So no, I would like to, wanted to get your perspective as a, I guess, uh, as a current practicing mm -hmm. clinician on how you see handheld ultrasound, you know, uh, ultrasound imaging uh, impact both um, in the emergency room, but also at home in terms of how you might manage, you know, your patients that you want to um, send home? So, you know, um, I'll be honest with you. I um, haven't thought as much about how am I going to um, send my patient home with the, you know, I haven't thought about that question in detail, but I can tell you that just because I haven't thought about it doesn't mean that it's not around the corner, right? Um, I'll tell you that my experience with um, teleguidance or remote share and a number of other um, sort of um, devices that are out there that are pocket size, right? So I may not have thought about how to extend it to home, but I can tell you that the value of this, I'll give you two examples I'm sorry if this is redundant for some of you guys on this call, but um, one of them was a um, pediatrician friend of mine that personally called me from Iran. I'm from Iran, and she's a pediatrician. She's not a pediatric EM doctor. She was staffing the urgent care setting or acute care setting, not in a hospital, but in a clinic. And she had this child that she was convinced had intussusception. Both she and I had purchased um, this particular device and together just for fun. And we were sort of just learning on the fly. I was helping her learn and she was reading. So she said, this patient comes in with X, Y, and Z, and I'm concerned for an obstruction. And I don't know if I'm getting the best image. Can you help me? And I sat in my garage in America and she dialed in and I had her on my computer and I literally held her hand and looked at this donut shaped thing that was in susception. Very cool. And I said, nothing is gonna happen if you call your um, IR or your radiology or surgeon, because it's a big deal, you know, A, she's a female, B, She's in the community. See, she has to wake up the big wig to come in to do this. So it, it's a big deal. And we did that. And the other uh, thing is during the pandemic, um, I was asked to train a group of family practitioners in a rural setting that absolutely had no, ult no experience with ultrasound. I'm talking we have to do like physics 101 or 100 if there is any. So I had those guys tell me three applications that they were most interested in. One of them included 
a shoulder a musculoskeletal for rotator cuff stuff, one of them that included, um, and also for dislocation, one of them was gallbladder and the other one was a DDT because that's what family practitioners do. And I not only was able to teach them all remotely, I was able to credential some of these applications. And so, um, you know, when you ask about ED, that's everybody knows why we need ultrasound and really handheld in the ED. I can guide you to put a central line. I could guide you to put a peripheral IV, to do a paracentesis, et cetera. But also um, the next level, your doctor's office, a gal from Iran that's the kid in her mm -hmm. clinic. Um, I haven't thought about how it would be at home. You know, I'm sure that if, say, somebody had a pericardial effusion and uh, we, they ended up undergoing a procedure and now they're at home with some guidance, somebody could put a handheld in one particular area to monitor this effusion getting better or worse. We're getting into a little bit of a tricky topics in terms yeah. of liability, but I could see that being the next thing going on. Awesome. And I have more examples, honestly. Joseph, do you have a, got a question? Yeah, uh, Gordon, um, uh, maybe we, uh, we could extend your question to not only home, but the field. Yes. The field, the field could be a war zone. The field could be a boat in Persian Gulf. The uh, field could be an ambulance or a helicopter. And I think it's so the, the problem for us as a company is that unfortunately there is no reimbursement, there is no payer that wants to cover it. And I'd love to hear about GE's experience on this one or anybody else's. But yeah. you know, it's so important to go to the field because for the following reason, I'm, um, uh, we have many patients that come in by the time they get to ER their problem is gone and we don't know we have to just go with historical uh, reports instead of actual objective data secondly there are people at home that experience some sort of a brain problem those are very transient and they come to doctor over and over again and it happens only once every three or four months so you can't just keep monitoring them at home continuously but you can give this device which we have in fact done so you can actually do it from home but then you need to really, Gordon, speaking of biodesign, you need to also think about the design element of this device. If it's going to go to home, you don't have a specialized, oh, you right. can't train millions of people. So it has to be so obvious and yeah. designed so bulletproof. So yeah, one, of the, two... one of the trends that um, yeah, I'd hope to talk about, and we're missing the, uh, James from BioIntelligence, which is a home monitor. So I was going to talk to him about uh, how that how that worked, um, but um, um, you know, so you know that's that's one of the areas I want to talk about was um, that often now because where yes, there's the field applications, but um, often you know the first time you'll see people is often in the front line in the emergency room and they do care setting, and um, the trend, there's a trend to instead of admitting patients to the hospital, you admit them to home, and then and then there's you know, um, enabling uh, technology, you know, technologies, monitoring and otherwise that make that that make that go. Um, and uh, and maybe, you know, just just to continue that, do you see EEG monitoring, um, you know, playing a role in that? Is there yeah, what absolutely. would be what would be a use case, do you think, of, uh, where you would want to monitor someone's EEG where yeah. I yeah. guess, the re you know, you're not in an acute care setting, so you have to live with the fact that if you see something emergent, it's going to take a little bit to react to it. Um, right, 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 right. I think the use case would be all these events that happen that are, we don't know if they are migraines, if they are small strokes, TIAs, or, or or psychogenic or whatever. They happen so randomly, unpredictably so. And for example, many patients with Alzheimer's disease um, or patients with um, uh, uh, some sort of handicap, we can't bring them to ER. We can't, uh, by, uh, first of all, they get, uh, I mean, imagine like you're bringing a, a severely demented patient and you want to uh, hook them up to these wires and so on for monitoring. But if they are at home, uh, their loved ones can do it whenever the event happened right there and then and put it on 
and then the device will capture it and save it and you can definitely review it when you come and meet the patients uh, meet the doctor right and um, so, so joseph what you said was just uh you know you asked about things in the field i realize i have it on my kitchen table so i'm going to hold it up this is the entire ultrasound it's got two different probes it's got a curvilinear probe and a linear probe it uses your screen and I, I told you I also work for the federal government, so I'm the chief medical officer of one of the federal disaster response teams. Of course, I bring this with me. I actually carry this more often than I should. And I was driving up the highway. I saw somebody crash in front of me. I pulled over to help. They were trapped in their car by their steering wheel. So I called 911 like everybody else would. And they started going down the tubes. And I had this because I have it too often. I did a fast exam in the car on the patient while they were trying to extricate him. So they were using the jaws of life to cut him out. When they called into the ED, I said, look, you guys don't know who the hell I am, but I'd love to speak to the ED doc. And I said to the ED doc, look, if I were you, I wouldn't believe me either. But I literally just did a fast exam. There's, there's fluid in Morrison's pouch. He's got to go right to the ED. Just have your, you have your OR. I mean, he's got to go right to the OR. Have your OR already ready. And then, of course, verify that I'm not a moron and that I saw what I saw. And I got to tell you, the ER doc very nicely called me back and said, we already had the surgeon there. It took us 30 seconds to verify what you told That's us. Awesome. The patient was in the ED. So, yeah, and, and it's so it's so useful and it's so tiny. So, you know, look, I can put it in my pocket. And, uh, <laughs> I, got, I have two, two comments. Useful. I have two comments to that. First one is, Joseph, on these panels, you should bring your product, too, and show it so we see right well, now. I'm, I'm, 14, right? I'm 14, 14 hours away, just landed, by the way, so I'm severely jet-lagged. Um, oh, no I didn't, I'm, I'm not at home to show you the device, but I do what actually Jeff does. I carry it with myself, and I do it on friends and others. Yeah. Well, the other thing I was going to say, if I get in a car accident, I want to have Jeff in the car behind me because that's how <laughs> um, so one of the things, and maybe we could talk a little bit, and we'll get to questions in just a second. There's some good ones. Um, if the uh, part of the this catalyst to moving patients to home was driven by COVID and you know overcrowding, capacity management, and things like that, and obviously you know obviously COVID's not over, um, but sort of learning to maybe live a little bit more, um, you know. Where do you see the pendulum swinging um, in that sense? You know, a lot of cases, does it go back to the way it was before or do we think the world's changed? Maybe Jeff, you're shaking your head. Yeah, let me, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's no reason or, and there's no way it should go back to where it was before. Patients are so much more comfortable at home. There's a decrease in nosocomial infections because they're home and they're not necessarily getting exposed to other pathogens that they might not otherwise. So for all of the cases where you can do so safely and be able to do it in the home, there's huge, huge benefit to the patient for being able to be cared at at home. I don't think we're going to see that reversed. And then the question is, what do you need? Um, as Joseph will tell you, if it's a patient who you were concerned, maybe they're having petite mal seizures, maybe there's some other explanation being able to do an EEG monitor is there. As, um, as, as Marjan will tell you, um, being able to do ultrasound and do some imaging on these patients while they're here. And it's one of the reasons why we've tried to take that big step forward and say, hey, the first step of this is having the patient be able to acquire ultrasound images on themselves. Right. And we're doing that now. Um, I cannot imagine taking huge, just like telemedicine, you know, before COVID, telemedicine was kind of a, you know, a, an outlier. And right. I would say telemedicine now is, is totally mainstream. I mean, right, you guys, what do you think? Well, it's just to, to, and just to comment on that, I don't know if the, you know, if you guys are fo following this, but um, there were some quote unquote temporary changes made. There was a Medicare uh, waiver program and rules on telemedicine were, were changed during COVID, but um, they, they expire. Some of them in since July. And unless Congress takes action. So um, I guess that's a, you know, there's a, there's a policy impact as well that's going to overlay a lot of this because um, getting paid for doing something uh, drives a lot of, uh, you know, of use. Um, so maybe in a general question, uh, any thoughts on that? Or, or as you said, are, are the, you know, the topic you were touching on before. 
I mean, does GE does GE lobby for these kind of things? I, I might imagine. So, so, so we do. Um, you know, part of it is also the documentation. One of the nice things about um, how we've addressed this, and I talked about reporting as being one of the main aspects of it. Not only if you didn't document it, you didn't do it, but if you didn't document it, you know you're not getting paid for it. So being able to send these images up to the cloud to have quality control, to have them potentially be overread, um, this whole aspect. Um, GE has also gone into supporting some of the whole concept of home care and telemedicine um, and um, enabling that from the, um, you know, obviously we don't provide the care, we're not a direct care provider, but we provide the technology to enable that care. I think it would be so dumb that not even Congress will do it. To try and, <laughs> I would to just try like and to pay attention us. to how Congress operates, but yeah. But, that, yeah. That's like, yeah. but to try and push us back from that. And and patients have become, have, have really started to love it. It decreases costs. It improves satisfaction. There's so much data out there that quality of care is at least as good, if not in some cases better. And the outcomes are at least as good, if not some cases better. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it should be here to stay, and I hope it will be here to stay. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of things uh, that technology can enable. So, you know, we've had, I was working on a project just the other day of uh, doing a, a pre-surgical visit, and instead of having somebody come in to the hospital to do it, there were technology tools that one could do more of that at home. So you avoid a visit, and, and somebody who lives hours away and has to leave work and all those things that can, can mess with that. Um, and Joseph, did you, you want, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the policy, you're absolutely right on, which brings us to DRG-based uh, payment to the hospital. I know that Dan has asked us to comment on how ED-specific problems and hurdles uh, we see. I think from a, from a company side, uh, we have had problem with ED, Marjan, to get in because ED says, well, 80% of these altered patients I'm going to admit. So why should I pay for this procedure? Why should I buy this device? Uh, the, it's not the ED uh, physicians, but it's uh, ED administrators want to have some sort of a return. If this patient is going to be paid by DRG and it's going to be admitted, why should, as an ED, buy this device? And that's like a major problem. And we have to we have, to have a champion within ED as a medical doctor, as a nurse, as a leader to go and say, you know, we don't care about this payment yet. This is extremely important to have clinically. We must buy it. I don't know what the experience is, Jeff, and uh, with, with GE and portable ultrasounds, but that's a problem. ED payment, I think it is, it's, it's very, yeah, you're, very you're, you're, you're right on. And it's one of the many reasons, but we address being able to keep the images up in the cloud, not only to do quality control, get feedback, but also to document the reimbursement. And there is a practical aspect to that. It takes, um, it takes the clinician's time. And if they are not reimbursed, reimbursed for their time, it becomes okay. difficult. So okay. reimbursement is important. Is if the patient is admitted, can can ED get reimbursed for the uh, for ultrasound procedure? Um, the the yes. So the answer is yes. You can be reimbursed for ultrasounds that are done in the emergency department, whether or not the patient is admitted or not. You have to document why the um, why it was clinically necessary. But there are DRG codes for that, and and that absolutely exists. Um, there are also small hospitals where the ED physician may end up going up to the floor. I mean, I, you know, I've worked in little hospitals where I had to run codes everywhere in the hospital. And if you're running up there and you have to do a bedside ultrasound to see if your patient has a pneumothorax or not, you can also get reimbursed for that, um, even though the patient's in the hospital. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot of paperwork and a lot of details to those things. Um, but can I make a comment, uh, if I may? Is that okay? Please. I um, just wanted to say that I think just being in pediatrics, I know that this is very futuristic and innovative and we're talking about that. But again, there's a very big elephant is that um, there are a lot of our providers um, in the clinic settings, doctors, nurse practitioners, EMS folks, people in the military, right? Up in the helicopter life flight that don't know how to use these devices, right? And so the key is, if you teach them how to use this, 
And I don't really know about the device of the, the brain device at all. I just have no expertise in that. But with ultrasound, the biggest thing is you could know how to do a fast exam and you could do it. But if you're not credentialed by a certifying credentialing body to say that you are credentialed to do this, you can't bill for this, period. So it's very important to train our providers in the clinic mm -hmm. settings, even in some community hospitals, up on our wards to do some of these things because it is revenue producing as long as it's medically necessary. And next, once we've mastered that, I think we could move to our house. I just always have a hard time, you know, in a primary care setting, for example, when a doctor doesn't know how to do an ultrasound, that their patient is supposed to know how to do one. So I think somebody has to teach them unless AI is going to take over, which is a possibility. Um, but in terms of reimbursement, et cetera, I know in the ultrasound world anyway, point of care ultrasound, they're very um, robust and strict guidelines for how you can bill, who can bill, what will get paid, what kind of images are necessary, et cetera. So um, yes, it's a, it's a little bit involved in detail in our world anyway. Yeah, Joseph, and maybe have you thought about uh, that, the use of, you know, of Cervell's technology in, say, not in the hands of a neurologist who can interpret, but rather in the hands of an ED. And how, you know, yeah. it sounds like you made the decision to, to make this more of a decision support tool as rather what a definitive right. diagnosis would require. Right. From, so maybe how, how are you thinking about that for future generations? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in smaller hospitals, uh, Gordon, um, it's actually being used uh, by non-neurologists. And also it's buying the neurology quality of life. So, for example, in some hospitals, if there's a patient who's altered, you have to wake up the patient, uh, uh, the neurologist. A neurologist has to order the EEG. And then you have to wake her up or him up to read the EEG. And then this person has to wake up a couple of times throughout the night to check on the EEG to see if something bad is happening. But in the hospital, they say, you know what? If somebody comes with altered, put cerebell on. Do not wake me up if it's all green. And let the device and robot keep monitoring every 10 seconds. And whenever it starts screaming, wake, uh, wake me up. If not, in the morning, I will come, read, and I'll get $500 reimbursed. So there's a good reimbursement for it, but... Uh, but um, uh, a, a neurologist or a credential person has to has to review yeah. it and read it. But See, throughout the night, AI takes over, uh, Gordon. Great. Well, I wanted to make sure we had time to t touch on some of the questions that showed up in the chat. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I guess the first question was, um, uh, for devices in the ED, have you uh, run into any ED-specific hurdles or opportunities that were unexpected? Um, so maybe I'll just open that up to if anyone has a, a perspective on that. There is a range of skill set in the um, ED providers. Um, that's always one of the hurdles. I'd imagine Joseph has run into that as well, um, as well as getting that knowledge and option from it. It sounds like um, Marjan, who would love to have used um, your device, Joseph, um, uh, just couldn't get there from here. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that was an example of, uh, um, you know, just a practical so limitation. Range of screens. Of, uh, and I guess in, in, if you got outside the United States, that would be probably compounded. Um, yeah. And uh, I think, Gordon, ED is a very crowded space in, in terms of who we are going to train. There are just tens of ED physicians, uh, physician assistants, oh gosh, nurses in hundreds, you know, for, for a nice volume ED. It's not like an ICU uh, that, you know, uh, has probably seven, eight doctors, period. So the training of people in the ED can be quite challenging. But the opportunity that we saw was that there are, and in every single ED, there are respiratory therapists and there are ED techs. And those uh, people love to do these type of uh, procedures. And uh, yeah. Great. Residents and doctors, uh, young. What we have noticed, uh, Gordon, is that there's a generation gap. Uh, usually, young, younger doctors, um, medical students, and so on, they love to have their hands on and do these type of stuff. They love to play with AI. They are not scared of AI, you know. Right. 
<laughs> it sounds like there's still some structural things though in terms of getting paid and otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe the next question was to, directed to you, uh, 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 Jeff, was how close are we to these AI systems actually delivering the distance support to clinicians in the ED right now? Is that live now or is that still in the future? So yes, some of it is live now um, and it depends on the specific device, but we have devices which will actually calculate real time the ejection fraction, um, will uh, calculate the inferior vena cava index, will give you dynamic feedback on whether you're um, uh, the, the fourth chamber view or the heart that you have is diagnostic. Um, uh, there are devices which will, uh, again, all that exist, which will quantitate B lines and going to other modalities. We have a device which will tell you if your ET tube is in the appropriate uh, location, uh, will help you identify a pneumothorax. Nice. Um, so yeah, AI is obviously here to stay and is growing incredibly rapidly in many, many different uh, directions simultaneously. Um, so yeah, there's a lot out there and uh, there's a lot more that uh, obviously we're working on both in-house as well as with our, our partners. Um, so yeah, more to come. So, so here's a, an unmet need uh, that someone identified, one of the panelists, um, monitoring volume status for CHF patients with a portable ultrasound at home field. Um, what's the... Uh, is there any, is, is that an opportunity GE has identified? And is that something? Uh, ab absolutely. And there are so many ways we can do it. I, I mentioned IVC index a couple of ways. And basically the collapsibility of your IVC is one way to, you know, say, are you too dry? Are you um, fluid overloaded? Obviously quantitating what B lines you have gives you a functional idea of whether your um, overloaded ejection fraction speaks to that as well. Uh, there's active research people on this know uh, looking at simple changes in uh, carotid blood flow from a, an intervention as simple as a, a leg lift. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to be uh, to be looking at that. And um, uh, ultrasound uh, absolutely plays a role. Most of that, though, is by somebody who's a little bit more skilled and can interpret it. So we are not there yet that somebody would be able to do their own ultrasound to assess their fluid. In our, uh, status. So what are the, so let's look at that application. What, what are the, uh, you know, obviously with some instances, you know, the information needs to be, you know, super precise. There's a, there's a tight therapeutic window you have to manage, but in other cases for this indication, let's say for that monitoring of congestive heart failure, um, what are the, what are the, bar the use, user barriers to having somebody do that at home? And are there ideas as to how, I mean, Marjan talked about, you know, talking someone through it on the phone, which doesn't sound very scalable. Um, I mean, how, how could you, maybe you don't want to give us, you know, the, the next secret prod product, but how, how would you crack that one, that problem in terms of the, you operate, the dependency so, on skilled operators? If anybody has watched TV at all, you have to have seen a thousand times this little um, advertisement for you can monitor your heart, your EKG at home. I mean, you can't turn your TV on and not see that ad. So obviously that helps you to identify um, AFib. So your question is basically, what else might I be able to monitor and might somebody be able to monitor themselves? As I noted, we are already working with another company to monitor certain aspects during um, uh, their uh, high-risk pregnancy. So um, being able to dynamically guide someone um, so you could have somebody do an ultrasound and be dynamically guided as they are by their OBGYN for the high-risk pregnancies. That's probably going to be the first step. The second step will be they'll be dynamically guided directly by the AI. Okay. We're not there yet, but that's definitely coming. Um, and, of course, there's going to be the, the step after that where it'll just, you know, be so intuitive to use. Um, like the little EKG, all you have to do is put your fingers on it and, and you're there. Good. Well, I see Dan coming on. I, mean, we, I guess we might be at time. We've got one more question, but should we uh, shut it down? Or? Dan, what? Gordon, I do want to say that uh, when you said that uh, with, with sort of talking them through it, it's uh, really a little bit beyond that. 
I mean, I have control um, over what their gain is, what their depth is. Right. I can bring an arrow. I can literally, literally hold their hand. It's not a matter of move up or down superior or inferiorly. It's literally guiding the patient or the provider to do this. It's like yeah, me at point. the bedside, but not. It's, it. it's not close to that. Great. Yeah, excellent point. Dan, I think we're, uh, is that our? Yep. Well, I appreciate everybody being here. This has been a great conversation. Um, like you said, I really want uh, Dr. Hirsch in the car behind me at all times because uh, <laughs> I have a, 19, a 1987 uh, uh, Ford Ranger, and I know that steering wheel is coming into my chest someday. Dan, uh, we can, Dan, we can also install our device on your seat, pass it, uh, on your driver's seat. There we go. That can, that can measure whenever you get drowsy, it buzzes you and wakes you up, you know. Nice. Nice. So that was one of my, you know, one of my thoughts. We don't have much time more now, but um, is really about a lot of yours are intermittent device use. I'm very interested in how these become continuous monitors, right? Continuous ultrasound, continuous, you know, EEG monitoring. I think those are very interesting places where this information can go. But we're out of time now. Thank you, everybody. We're going to close this out, and the next roundtable will start in the next five minutes. So just click on that link once you open that. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very Thanks, much.